Hi there, guys. This is Rita. This is Amanda. You're listening to I, I Don't, Don't Know, Know Her, Her, the podcast where we talk about women you've probably never heard of, but you certainly should have Jesus Christ. And you will. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a couple of things we wanted to talk about up at the top. One is that we've talked a little bit about the band L7. Motherfuckers, they're coming. <laughs> so L7 is releasing a brand new album, which you should all go out and purchase because they are the badassest of badass chicks. Is that a word? Badass? It is, it is now. Did, uh, yeah, I'm going to make it one. Done. I can do that. I, I, I have an English degree. <laughs> <laughs> so they have this brand new album that's coming out. Rolling Stone already was like, this is one of the best albums of 2019. You should definitely get it. So you should definitely go download it. They're also embarking on a national tour and they're coming to Spokane. Yeah. They're coming to Spokane on June 10th and we're going to do our damnedest to, to not only there. go, but I'm going to... I'm going to hit Jennifer Finch up. Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to see if we can like hey girl, hey. chat with him. I was like, maybe we could bring a portable recorder and just get something for the show from them or something. Oh, that'd I thought be, that would be, that'd so, be oh, so fucking cool. cool. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to do that. They're obviously busy and Jennifer Finch will probably be like you again. <laughs> <laughs> There's but, this weird Northwest podcast that keeps bothering me. <laughs> Oh, speaking of Northwest podcast, tell our audience about your cousin. Oh, okay. So um, I'm born and raised in Washington and my cousin, who is um, my cousin James Basinger, started his own podcast. I had no idea that he was doing this. Um, It's called Hide and Seek. You can find them on Instagram and on Facebook. And it's about uh, the disappearance of this woman from uh, Tenino, Washington. Is it Tenino or Tenino? I think it's Tenino. Tenino? Yeah. And she went missing back in, what was it, 2013, I think. And so she was a mother of two. She went missing. Um, So my cousin's podcast is basically trying to find out what happened to this woman. So it's a mystery, kind of thriller. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool. If you're into true crime podcasts, you know where to turn. Exactly. So a funny thing is, Rita texted me, oh my God, my cousin started this podcast. It's about this missing woman. And I was out with my friend, Amy, who had literally the hour before been like, you know, my friend I've told you about who's dating that guy whose wife disappeared. So there's this podcast about this disappearance. And I was like, (laughs) wait a minute, this can, this, this cannot be a coincidence. So Mm -hmm. when I asked Rita, I was like, what's the name of the podcast? And she sent it to me and I turned to Amy and I was like, what's the name of the podcast? And she says, <laughs> hide and seek. And there I flipped go. the phone to show her. And I was like, that's Rita's cousin. <laughs> I was like, damn, man. Sp- uh, like Spokane's a small place, but this is all over the state of Washington. Like mm-hmm. they disappeared in like Aberdeen, right? Like, where not that where she was from? I don't know. I think. Anyway, we've got Tonino, Aberdeen, Seattle, Spokane, the whole fucking state of Washington mm-hmm. is going to be represented over here. <laughs> So anyway, if you're into true crime, go listen to yeah, Hide go and check seek. it out. And um, you know, I was discussing with him too, maybe of doing I don't know some kind of little collab or something like that. But I told him definitely give you a shout out because your family. Yeah, and it's an interesting topic too because I yeah. love true crime stuff too. Yeah, love it. <laughs> uh, other thing I wanted to touch on today was the TV show Shrill. Okay, so I've been seeing buzz about it. I don't know what it's about. I have an idea of it. So what is it about? So it's based on the memoir by Lindy West called Shrill. Okay. Same name. And I read that. Actually, I listened to it on audiobook when I was training for a race a couple years ago when it first came out. And I already loved Lindy West as a writer. I read her stuff when she was at The Stranger, and I read her stuff when she was at Jezebel. And then I was involved in a project that she started uh, where I was one of the writers that she featured in a thing about... um, sexual assault mm. for teenagers called I I believe you it's not your fault I've heard of that yeah so yeah. I had two pieces featured in that okay and I thought I think actually you're probably the one that told me about it that's why <laughs> <laughs> so and she was super easy to work with and so kind in her emails and I was like I'm in love with you <laughs> and I follow her on Instagram and if you don't don't follow her on Instagram you should fucking do that now because she is one hilarious to has like the best style. And if you're a fat girl and you want a style icon, Lindy West is where you go because (laughs) she's actually currently selling her old clothes out of her own closet. What? I know. (laughs) 
Anyway, so the whole per, the whole like premise behind her memoir was this collection of essays about her life and growing up fat and like mm. what that's like and the fat shaming that she endured and then also coming into loving her body and being okay with being a fat woman. Mm. And so it goes through her love life and her family and probably one of the most compelling stories, which was featured on the podcast, uh, this American life is her story about this internet troll who like starts harassing her online Mm. and her dad had died. And this guy was even being like, her dad was probably glad he got cancer because he didn't have to have his whore cunt daughter a pig. Oh my pig god! Pig daughter. And it was like it was awful, awful Terrible. stuff. This guy. Yeah. So she like tracks him down and like confronts him in person. Whoa! And that's in the show, and it is awesome. Whoa! But it's it. It was kind of weird for me to watch it because I've known of her and her life for so long. Mm-hmm. Like she was really good friends with. Gioma Aluo, who is another writer who wrote the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, which you should also go buy. And you should follow her on Instagram because she does makeup tutorials and they're amazing. (laughs) And that's like her. She's a character on the show. Oh, it's it's just so weird to be like, these are all like real people that I know stories about. And I've been following their careers on a screen. And then they're like fictionalized versions of themselves on screen. It was so bizarre. But I just say like one, it's funny. It's really funny show. Um, My probably my favorite line is when (laughs) her roommate she has this like shitty fucking boyfriend who makes her go out the back door of his house because he doesn't want his friends to know he's dating a fat girl. (laughs) And whoa, (laughs) I know. So he shows up at their house to like apologize to her, but he doesn't knock or anything. He just stands at the door. And so her roommates like, I've got mace. (laughs) (laughs) And he, she maces him directly in the face. And he was like, Oh my God, why would you do that? You maced me in the face. And (laughs) she was like, I don't know what you want me to do about that. I don't apologize to white people. (laughs) (laughs) It's like my favorite line ever on a television show. (laughs) There's this scene. I think that's probably the most iconic scene and something you've never seen on television or in a movie ever in the history of cinema that I'm aware of. What is it? And it's this pool party that she goes to where it's all fat women. The whole thing is all fat women of different sizes, abilities, races, everything. And they're just living their best life. And the character is like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hmm. And she shows up like completely covered because she's covering it as a journalist. And so she's not participating. And she's there for a while. And she starts seeing all these women who are just comfortable in their bodies and comfortable in their skins. And she's like, oh my God, I, I want to be like this. And mm-hmm. she takes off all her clothes and dives into the pool. <laughs> and it was just really, really cool. And I watched an interview with Lindy where she talked about that scene and how when they were casting the extras for it, she yeah. was like, size 14 is the average American woman size. You could put one of them in there. But I want fat women. I want women who are the broad spectrum that you never, ever see. Mm -hmm. Ashley Graham is beautiful, but she's on the cover of magazines. I want women who will never be on the cover of magazines. And she was very specific about that. And they did. And the scene is, and she was like, and these are real women who are probably most of them who were there. This is the first time they've ever done this too. Like Mm -hmm. this actually, like they're just hanging out in bikinis and swimsuits, having the time of their lives with women who look like them. Wow. It was It's really powerful and I just, I highly recommend it. And there's only six episodes and it needs to be a second season. And you know the way that online shows work. If you don't watch the shit out of that, if you don't tell all your friends, if you don't get them to watch it, it will go down in flames like one day at a time. Oh. Got canceled and that's, I cried over that. I (laughs) cried over that show being canceled because there's never been that kind of representation before. And it made me really upset that we lost one day at a time. So don't let that happen to Shrill. Go watch it. Tell all your friends. Make them watch it twice. (laughs) Go have viewing parties. Invite your girlfriends over. Get in bikinis. Fucking drink martinis. (laughs) Put a pool in your house. I don't care. (laughs) 
<laughs> Put a kiddie pool in the living room. <laughs> Watch it in bikini. Amanda doesn't realize that I would probably actually do this and drag a pole in her house and sit in it. <laughs> I mean, I'm only half kidding. Did you see that a viral video of that guy who did that? No. He blew up a giant pool in his living room. What? And filled it with water and was like sitting in it. And his girlfriend gets home and she's like, What the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> it's British too. It's very funny. Oh my God. Yep. That and one time awesome. he buys her a swimsuit. <laughs> That's <laughs> they're funny as hell. It's this couple, this is what they do. It's real though, like they actually do these things. And it, he he buys her a swimsuit that looks like a hairy naked man's body. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they're on vacation and he purposely unpacked all of her other swimsuits. <laughs> what so an she asshole. has to, I know. I was like, if I were her, I think I'd actually be like, get the fuck out of my life. I would be so mad. But she actually, like, for a while she's like that, but she's mostly, like, they're both kind of comedians, right? So, like, she's like, this is going to be fucking hilarious. And she wears it to the beach and everybody is horrified. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, those are funny. If you want a light thing to read or watch, those videos are great. Nice. (laughs) Okay, I think we're ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. So I have this, like, fucking badass chick who is really funny and a great liar and I'm going to save her for last (laughs) great liar (laughs) and uh so I think uh I just want to tease you on that one so you stick around for that one all right because I'm gonna make Rita start (laughs) she's making me start (laughs) and I should mine's an inventor I've been super obsessed with like how do you watch that show how things are made no you don't? Oh, I love, like, there was one, this is, like, one of the dorkiest things ever, of like how buttons are made, like, buttons for pants and shirts. Okay. And they're made in, like, these long rods, and, like, the, the dyes and the plastics that they mix up, and then they, they chop them up super, super fast. Like, literally, thousands of buttons are made in, like, two seconds. Cool. And, but, uh, yeah, I watch stuff like that. It's how it's made. <laughs> it reminds me of, did you ever watch Reading Rainbow as a kid? Yes. And like sometimes he would like take Go you somewhere. to a factory yeah. and you would see how a thing you use every day is made. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> LeVar Burton is a hero. He is. Well, my lady today is Josephine Cochran. Okay. I don't know her. She is the inventor of the first commercially successful dishwasher. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is going to be fun. So Josephine was born in Ashtabula County, Ohio, in 1839 to John and Irene Garris. Her father was a civil engineer, and her great-grandfather, John Fitch, was an inventor known for steamboat-related inventions. I love that she comes from a family of inventors. Creators, right? Yeah. Creators. That stuff is in the blood, you know, writers or singers or, you know... I think Inventors. especially when it comes to creative stuff, but I don't generally think about that when it comes to scientific or engineering or whatever. Mm-hmm. I just don't put those together. But like teachers often have their kids turn into teachers, nurses or doctors, their kids often mm-hmm. turn into medical professionals. Like, and I've always wondered, like, is that because you see it and you know it and therefore that's the thing you gravitate towards? Or is it because that's just who you are? Mm-hmm. Like that's part of your genetic your makeup. destiny. Yeah. I don't know. So the creative tendencies were definitely in her family, but she was never formally educated in the sciences. She attended a private high school, but she stopped her education altogether after it burned down. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) So I, you know, I've known Amanda for a long time (laughs) and I keep finding out all this new stuff about her. Like her fucking school burned down. Yeah, uh, my school burned down. So my school burned down when I was in second grade. Let me tell you the story about it because it's really funny. So... (laughs) So I was at I was at school for the Christmas program, right? In my like, nice little frilly dress. We go home and there was supposed to be I think like one or two days left and then we were going to go on Christmas break. I think it was one day. So the next day would have been so everybody like I'm super stoked because those were that was the day you got to have your Christmas party in your classroom. Oh yeah. And everybody day. brought their treats. And so I get up for school and I'm like looking out I like I look and I know that it's late. How I old know are that you I'm late for time? school. Well, I'm eight, seven. Okay. Seven. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm late for school. And it's the most important day of the year. <laughs> and I go running into the bathroom and my mom is doing her morning routine. She's got the radio on. She's smoking a cigarette and curling her <laughs> hair at the same time. <laughs> and I was like, mom, I'm late for school. 
school. <laughs> and she was like, honey, you're not going to school today. And I was like, what? Why? Because she was obviously getting ready for work. Yeah. So I was like, why am I not going to school? What's going on? And she's like, come here. And she <laughs> lifts me up. And we had this tiny little bathroom window. And through the bathroom window, beyond the trees, I could see smoke. Oh, no. And she was like, that's your school. <laughs> what a way to do it. <laughs> well, my mom is not good at these kinds of things. There is your dreams. <laughs> yeah. Up in smoke, child. Everything you love will turn to dust. I can just see like a look of horror on your face as she blows smoke in your oh, face. Oh, I, I literally started crying. I was so upset. Aww. I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, something happened last night. The school burned down. <laughs> over the next three years well so that so the rest of second grade all of third grade and all of fourth grade i went to school in a roller skating rink this is weird y'all yeah so we went to school in a roller skating rink and obviously a roller skating rink is generally just a giant cavernous loud space yeah because it's meant for roller skates (laughs) and loud music and they like brought in carpet remnants and particle boards and like there were no doors, there were no rooms. It was just a big open space with particle boards separating each classroom. And so like, you know, when I got into like fourth grade, we used to put our hands underneath the particle oh board gosh. and like pass notes for friends in other classes <laughs> or just generally be dicks <laughs> and be like popping our heads underneath and be like, <laughs> cause we're Cause children. <laughs> And it was just a strange time. Like when we first moved into the roller skating rink, uh, obviously there was no way to eat lunch. So that's a sentence I never thought you'd say. (laughs) So the local businesses did these brown bag lunches where they would put sandwiches and potato chips and like an apple in it. And that was our meal. And we had to stand in this ridiculously long line to get this bag. And then we had to go back to our classroom. It was very bizarre. But eventually they were able to salvage a part of our school. They were able to salvage the elementary wing and the gym. And so we would get bussed from the the roller skating rink (laughs) down to the school to eat and then bussed back. Which I was like, why? That must have taken so much time. Like, yeah. When I think about how little time you have in the school day and to have us get on and off a bus multiple times a day. Yeah. what a nightmare no no thanks <laughs> yeah it was really funny it was a very strange time the middle school students went to school in the national guard armory with like actual tanks and guns <laughs> and the high school kids at the at the beginning were going to school in the courthouse like in the courtrooms so they would be like a jury <laughs> and audience members in a courtroom with like their teachers standing at the front in front of them <laughs> it might have inspired bench. some lawyers i don't know they I know they got to see it in action in a way i was really jealous of the high school students (laughs) i was like we're going to school in a roller skating rink and they get to go to school in a courthouse like how (laughs) fair is that but eventually because they were able to salvage most of the elementary wing they moved the high school students into the elementary wing oh my god which was not built for teenagers so everything was like at their knees (laughs) like they had to hang their coats on like the little hangers and you know, like little kids did. Like, this is like a this is a terrible story. <laughs> in the, the, ki- <laughs> the, in the kindergarten story. classes had all like kindergarten, you know, like kids don't necessarily make it to the bathroom in time, so they have inside classroom bathrooms. Yeah. So can you imagine being inside a classroom, like like your English class, right? Yeah. And you're like, I have to go to the bathroom, and the teacher just points. <laughs> And you have to go in front of all of your classmates. Like, what if you have your period and you're like no. switching on a tampon and you're like the guy you like is like 20 feet away? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I'm glad I didn't have to go through True. that. Well, yeah. We had a brand new school when I was in fifth grade and it was very cool. Weird, <laughs> but Weirdest yeah. story ever. So I can relate <laughs> to Miss Cochran to Ms. because Cochran. I lost my school too. <laughs> is her name? Wait, what was she born? Cochrane? She was born in 1839. Her maiden name was Garris. Okay. But she becomes a Cochrane later. Yes. Okay. So yeah, her school burns down. She didn't get to go to the roller rink, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she missed out. Oh, But around this same time, her mother passes away Aww. and her father ends up sending her to live with her older sister, Irene, in Shelbyville, Illinois. Because he couldn't possibly be a father. No. No. Okay. No. Just clear that up. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Very delicate men. 
So at the age of 19, Josephine marries in October of 1858 to William A. Cochran. So that's how she gets that name. He was 27 at the time. So she's 19, he's 27. That's a bit of a that's a bit of a stretch. It's a little gross. I mean, yeah. At least I mean, at least she's over 18. Over 18, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So he was a merchant and a county clerk for 16 years, a Freemason and a member of various uh, Demi- Democratic Party committees. Aren't Freemasons weird though? A little bit, yeah. Right? And from 1853 to 1857, William had been in California trying to strike it rich with the gold rush, and he didn't succeed. Mm. So he returns back to Shelbyville. He's got some money, and he starts a dry goods store. Okay, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was his original job? He was a merchant and a county clerk. He tries to... Well, I guess, I guess merchant and dry goods store, that makes sense. Mm. But I was like, that guy just has no direction. <laughs> He's dabbling. He's dabbling in some things. Uh, they had one son. His name was Hallie. He died at the age of two, sadly. Oh, boo. And shortly after, they had a daughter named Catherine. Josephine was a socialite, and so she and her husband, William, would entertain guests in their home. They were well off and accustomed to having servants do much of their housework for them. So they, they had some moolah. Mm-hmm. Josephine did not set out to create the dishwasher because, of course, that bitch ain't washing her own dishes. Yeah, I was like... <laughs> What? She doesn't even need a dishwasher. The idea came because she was frustrated of the servants were chipping her heirloom china that she had. And it was like heirloom china from like the 1600s. So oh, she yeah, you don't super delicate shit. You don't want to fuck with that. Hand washing that stuff, probably in a basin where it's, you know. It's probably pinking. concrete or yeah. cast iron, which like, like I... So we have a cast, well, we used to have a cast iron sink when we had our original ho- old house with mm-hmm. our original old sink. And like, if you just are like washing it and you tap mm-hmm. the side, shit just falls apart. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's because I have the the set of dishes that we have is a family dishes that were handed down to me after a death. So they're very important to me. And at this point, I don't think there is a plate left that isn't oh no yeah which is okay because these were her everyday dishes Mm -hmm. and she wouldn't have wanted them to like gather dust in a cupboard she would want them to be used Mm -hmm. so i feel like okay you know they're getting they're getting well loved someday they'll have to probably be replaced yeah so at first josephine tries to wash the dishes herself and she's like nah (laughs) i'm not gonna do this i bet she chipped them she found the tack burdensome she found the task burdensome. Burdensome. But so. she could just, you know, <laughs> yeah. pass it off to someone else. Okay. She starts working on a design, one that has water jets, a dish rack, that could hold the dirty dishes in place, and then the water moves around it. Duh. In 1883, she's in her early 40s at this time. She begins working on the design for the washer, and her sudden, suddenly her husband passes away. She was left with an enormous debt that she had no idea that he had accumulated. Oh, so he was a shady motherfucker. And they were living outside their means. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this sudden tragedy pushes Josephine, who's really fearful of losing her home and everything that she has. She becomes driven in her desire to create a successful model of her machine. Though others had attempted to create similar devices, like a hand crank model patented in the 1850s, none had become commercially viable. She was determined to have a machine that would meet consumer needs, meet demand, and be functional within homes. So That's just smart, logical, very. obviously. <laughs> like, hey, if I need this, don't you think everybody would need this? Well, and also, like, she's going about it the right way. She's like, well, you know, it should be the kind of thing that people can use. Like, it can't be something that's not actually meeting the, the needs mm-hmm. of the people who want it. I love it when women find... A need and fill it. It's our it's, it's our it's our whole thing. It's That's just what, what we, we do. do. <laughs> <laughs> Josephine worked in a small shed behind her home, and she measured uh, the dishes to create the machine around them, rather than the machine first. She constructed wire compartments to fit the plates, cups, saucers, and placed them inside of a wheel. It laid flat with a copper boiler underneath to heat the water. Okay. The wheel turned, powered by a motor, and the soapy water would squirt over the dishes to clean them. The first, so she's creating this design, she's creating this idea, but she needs somebody to kind of execute it for her. Yeah. um, Because she doesn't really know how to 
physically build to it. To build it, yeah. So Which she, I, I can understand that. Like you can you can have a mechanically minded mind. Mm-hmm. You can be like, I understand how point A needs to get to point B and this is how. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how to actually physically make those parts. Exactly. Well, I like I was wanting to create like a flower bed out of um these old iron pieces and i was like oh i can just weld them together i don't know how to fucking weld yeah exactly (laughs) you're like you understand how they need to get that way but can't actually do the thing exactly so the first few men she tried to hire uh, put her design into reality they insisted on tweaking it of course they did and the results didn't work (laughs) of course of course she was like, I don't think you understand how dishes work. I don't think you hear me is what I usually say. That's what I say personally in my life. I just don't think you hear me right now. <laughs> so finally, she hires this man named George Butters. I know. Mr. Butters. Come on. Aww. I just picture him like as a cat. <laughs> like Mr. Uh, Butters. <laughs> oh, a cat. See, I was going South Park. <laughs> <laughs> And that's where our heads are at today. His full-time job was as a mechanic for the Illinois Central Railroad. Working part-time with her in her back shed, he implemented her design and fitted the machine into her kitchen first. Okay, first off, I think it's cool that he's not... He didn't just take her design and go to some shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's like... It says that they were working together in the shed, right? Yeah. Which means that he's probably also teaching her hey, this is how this process works, and Mm -hmm. I think we need to do this, and if you want it to do this, you're going to need to have this happen. Like a proper collaboration. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm cool with Mr. Butters. (laughs) (laughs) The cat. The cat. So in 1886, she patents her design, and she begins making them for friends, calling the machine the Cochrane dishwasher. She took a bold leap, and she decided to advertise the machine in a local newspaper. Smart. Smart, yeah. Yep. She established the Garris Cochran Company, which is her maiden name and her married name. And soon restaurants and hotels became interested. In 1893, Cochran presented her machine at the Chicago World's Fair. Get it, girl. She ended up winning an award for its design and for its durability. Get it, girl. <laughs> so initially the machines were sold to businesses, not to local consumers. Um, homework... Homemakers admitted that they enjoyed washing dishes by hand. Bullshit. Right. And the machines <laughs> <laughs> the machines reportedly left a little bit of soapy residue on the dishes. So it wasn't perfect. Still a problem. Yeah. Still an issue. People don't want to taste soap. It's still a bit well, like the just the residue, like that film, that like white, white. Fi- mm-hmm. We still have that problem. And part of that is user error. Um Little known fact, my parents owned an appliance store. I know. <laughs> and uh, I learned a lot from my stepdad. He would just teach me shit every weekend because he didn't work on the weekends unless he was called out to do a job because it was an emergency or whatever. And so Saturdays, my mom still worked. And so he and I would spend time together and he would teach me things like how to change a tire, how to fix a washer. And I just learned a lot from him. He was like the smartest, most mechanically minded person in the world. Hmm. And he would talk about how dishwashers, no matter how good they are, no matter how high quality they are, no matter how great your water pressure is or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. it's going to have calcium buildup because that's just natural. That's just just in the water. You have to take it. You have to take your racks out and you have to take the bottom apart and soak it Mm -hmm. in things like CLR or whatever to remove all of that and then you just put it back together, run it once empty, and then it will be fine after that. Huh. So tip for the day. There you go. Maintain your dishwashers, folks. Yeah, and they probably just didn't have the stuff they needed to do that kind of thing. And no. it wasn't perfected yet. No. They also demanded like a great deal of hot water. And a lot of homes didn't have like hot water heaters like yeah. hotels did. Yeah, because what's and the year we're talking about here? We're in the 18... <laughs> 93. That's all you need to say is like, <laughs> obviously, there are not like modernized water heaters. No. So sales were mainly to restaurants and hotels, and it went for a whopping $150, which that's a that's lot, a lot, of, lot money. of money. I'm sure that was like five, six grand. I mean, no, I would say that here, I have a theory. Okay. I would bet that it wasn't, I just really enjoy washing dishes by hand. I think it was like, husbands were like, Bitch, that's expensive as fuck, and you're not getting You're one. not getting that. <laughs> and so they had to be like, well, I just don't want one because 
I like washing <laughs> dishes. <laughs> Oh, gross. That's, that's my theory, and <laughs> I'm sticking theory. to it. So at first, she contracted the building for her machines through the Tate Manufacturing Company in Illinois, with the process being managed by Butters. But in 1897, the business was growing enough that they could open up their own factory. They opened it in an abandoned schoolhouse, which I feel like that's very full circle with the story right now. <laughs> You can put a lot of shit in a van at schoolhouse. <laughs> Apparently. You can murder people in... I mean, no, I didn't... <laughs> fuck. I mean, put a warehouse in there. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so she ended up having three employees overseen by Butters, and she named it the Cochrane Crescent Washing Machine Company, which is pretty... I mean, three employees? Yeah. That's decent. I mean, we have two. Yeah. She said the hardest part of getting established was going to the hotels herself to do sales. And in those days, like women just did not do that. And they, I bet that they didn't take her seriously. No. Her next model that she came up with was motorized. It pumped the water itself and moved the rack back and forth. She registered this one for an American patent in 1900. A subsequent model had the racks revolve and it drained itself via like a, a hose that went into the sink, which Good. was really cool. Which is still how some dishwashers yeah. are. Well, I remember um, growing up, like my grandma's uh, dishwasher and washing machine did that. Oh, like, I've not seen washing machines The washing machine that. had this giant hose that she would just put into the backyard, which I'm sure like all that soap was super healthy for the grass. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> really great for the water table. Right. It, actually, our... Um, our when we lived in the house across from the park, oh yeah, we we had that. That's how you had to hook up the washer because it was that house was built at a time when you would just take a hose and put it into the sink. Wow! So it was in the basement though, so like it it wasn't. So I'm thinking about like kitchens, mm-hmm. and um, that's how Abby's mom's kitchen is. Oh, she wow. has to. The dishwasher lives like up against a wall next to the refrigerator. And when she wants to use it, she has to pull it over to the sink and then oh my hook God. it up. There's a hose that hooks up to the actual faucet wow. and then a hose th- that pulls water in and then a hose that goes into the sink so to that's drain. Josephine's design. Exactly. Like this is 2019. This is my mother in law's kitchen. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> So she managed her own company until she died of a stroke on August 3rd, 1913 in Chicago. She was buried in the Graceland Cemetery in Shelbyville, Illinois. So I was the, like, she was buried at Graceland. <laughs> that didn't even exist. Oh, never mind. We're talking about something different. We're talking about a place. <laughs> so the rights to her dishwashing machine company were bought out by the Hobart Company in 1916. Which I've heard of. Hobart Technologies. Exactly. So then Hobart labor, later renamed itself as uh, you probably heard of it KitchenAid yes KitchenAid that's awesome <laughs> and the Whirlpool Corporation yes so. which is what my parents sold <laughs> we're Whirlpool <laughs> oh my gosh this story is just all incorporated. that's right it's all about me folks yeah <laughs> So, of course, the machine's popularity skyrocketed in the 1950s when everyone was like gadget crazy. And, and there's a lot the, of wealth. Yes. And you yeah. had the latest, greatest, coolest machines in your kitchen. And people bought things. It was very materialistic because people bought things to be like, oh, Status. look what I have. Mm-hmm. I have two cars. It was the I have. birth of the Joneses. Yes. Yeah. I have a dishwasher. <laughs> oh, you don't? <laughs> How plebeian. What are you, poor? <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, today the dishwasher is pretty much in everybody's home. Yeah. Um, I had a hard time, like, using my dishwasher. We finally broke down and started using the one that we've had in our apartment for seven years. And I've barely been using it now just to, like, help with the household because I always did dishes by hand. Yeah. And we had a dishwasher in our house growing up. And my mom was like, oh, no. She's like, I got six kids. Do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, like, you've got six kids, like, use the fucking dishwasher. No, she she would just... But she had you dishwashers two were, built yeah, in. Exactly. They, they had hands. Tiny hands. Tiny little yeah. hands. So it always... I I have this odd feeling of, like, guilt when I use the dishwasher. Like, I'm being lazy. No. And, like, I should just wash them myself. But it's it's convenient. It's nice. I, I, we, I pay the Avista. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't start using our dish. Well, so we lived in, my wife and I lived in this house for seven years that did not have a dishwasher because it had never been updated and it was built in 1909. Uh, And then we lived in an apartment that had a dishwasher and it it sucked. 
we would use it occasionally, like if we had a really big meal and mm. lots of dishes. But we just generally didn't use it that often because it was kind of a shitty dishwasher. And then we moved into a house across from the park, beautiful little, tiny little house though. And the kitchen was pretty small. And it was if, tiny. If yeah. you had if you had done the dishes in there, and by hand, you would never have a counter space. And I hate no. clutter on countertops. It's a big pet peeve of mine. That's why I stopped doing. If I had a dishwasher, that's why I stopped doing di- dishes by hand mm. because I hated the countertop space being constantly covered, covered. in stuff. Oh yeah. So now that we have this house and a really nice dishwasher. I am really adamant about like, we can keep our, we have these beautiful marble countertops that were put in by the people before us. And I just don't want them to be covered by like (laughs) towels and dishes constantly. And we actually find we're, we've been trying since we moved into this house to make sure we eat out less. So Mm. we cook a lot and we probably have to run that thing every two days and there's just two of us in the house. Oh, wow. So we're really like using the hell out of it now. And I feel pretty good about that because we always had the philosophy that it should be completely full before you run it, obviously, because mm-hmm. it's better for the environment. Oh, yeah. Um, and actually, I so I used to think like hand washing was better for the environment, but it just depends on how many dishes there are. Because if you're doing a lot of dishes and you're having to run the water a lot to keep rinsing it when mm-hmm. you're doing it by hand, you're going to be better off with a dishwasher. Yeah. So... Which is a controlled amount of water. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And and you can buy energy efficient ones Mm -hmm. and you can also build systems in your house that recycle all your water. And I mean, it's just modern conveniences are good. Not always bad. Not always bad. Yeah. And thank you, Miss Cochran, for building it. (sighs) Thank you, Josephine. Uh, So I got my information from uh, cooksinfo.com, lemelson.mit.edu, therobinsonlibrary.com patentplaxblog.com and Google Patents, which you can actually look up her patent and see her dishwasher design. Uh, the patent number is capital U, capital S, 355139 if you want to take a look at Josephine's invention. If you're a nerd like Rita and you like, like to look up patents. I like to look up patents. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I loved that story. Well, I'm excited for yours. Okay, I'm really excited. Are you ready? I'm ready. Have you heard of Bessie Stringfield? I don't know her. Good. She's the motorcycle queen of Miami. What? Okay. (laughs) See, I told you, you're going to love this one. Uh, So I'm going to just, I'm going to tell you her whole story and then I'm going to start over a little bit. Okay. So just be prepared. Bear bear with. So uh, Bessie Stringfield was born Betsy Lenora Ellis on February 9th, 1911 in Kingston, Jamaica to Maria Ellis and James Ferguson. According to Bessie, her mother was a domestic servant and her father was the white man she worked for. And they like ran away to America. Ooh, is this like a torrid love affair kind torrid of thing? Torrid love affair. Ooh. In so like these this kind of varies a little bit, but in some accounts both of her parents died of smallpox, but in one account it says that her mother died. And her father just abandoned her. He Mm -hmm. didn't want to take care of her on the streets of Boston. So when she was five, she was adopted by a wealthy Irish woman who raised her to be Catholic. Okay. So she was this Jamaican girl who was being raised by an Irish woman. And somewhere along the line, her name shifted from Betsy to Bessie. Okay. But there wasn't a lot of information about how or why that happened. Maybe just like a nickname or something like that. Maybe. Or maybe it's like, you know how like sometimes like little kids or whatever can't say a, their sibling's name and that just becomes the way everybody calls that person? Mm-hmm. I was like, well, maybe that happened. Maybe there's like a little kid in her life. Somewhere along the line, though, that became Bessie. Bessie, for whatever reason, desperately wanted to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> like, really, really wanted it. And... So when she was 16, her mother bought her a motorcycle called an Indian Scout, even though her mother said, nice girls don't ride motorcycles. <laughs> but she bought it for her anyway? I guess. Okay. And Bessie then began teaching herself how to ride motorcycles. And she was a natural. Later on in life, she said that God had given her the ability to ride. So she tre- she actually traded about two years later, a year and a half after she got that first motorcycle, she traded it in for a Harley, Ooh. which she preferred. And absolutely became a Harley girl. And throughout her life, 
she would over time buy 27 Harleys. Jeez. And she, she said once that to me, a Harley is the only motorcycle ever made. <laughs> and her first Harley was blue, like a powderish, like periwinkle blue. Ooh. And this became her signature. She never, ever again bought a Harley of a different color, according to what I was reading. She said, okay, this is, this, this, she's a, she's a character. Okay. This is what she said. It's got to be blue and it's got to be new. I never bought anything used except husbands. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty good. I just want to side note on the husband thing. So speaking of husbands, Throughout the course of her life, she it said that she had had six different husbands. Oh, my God. All of whom were younger than her, 22 to 24 years younger than her. Ooh, get it, girl. And when she was 70, she was being interviewed by a woman, and she said that I wouldn't have a man over 35, even now. <laughs> and I just love that. Like, she, she is a character. So when she was 19, she decided she wanted to go on a really long road trip on her motorcycle. But she didn't like planning things. She's kind of fly by the seat of her pants kind of person. Yeah. So she tossed a penny over a map and wherever it landed, that's where she was going to go. Wow. Yep. So she just plans a route based on like these pennies. And in 1930, this is when she's embarking on this, motorcycles and motorcyclists in general just weren't very common. Mm. And they definitely weren't common for women. That was unheard of. Because it was unladylike, right? Yeah. Also, important to note that America's roads were mostly dirt roads at the time. The interstate system would not be built for 25 more years. Jeez. So she's riding down dirt roads, which often meant that, like, you know how dirt roads are. Like, if you ride them all the time, your shit's going to fall apart. Yeah. So she often would break down on the road and have to fix it herself. She was, like, really mechanically minded, really uh, resourceful. And obviously quite brave. Like, I don't know about you, but the idea of riding a solo motorcycle trip in an unknown place on a dirt road Mm -hmm. as a black woman Mm -hmm. in 1930? That's scary. That's terrifying. So I just thought she was so brave. And she was, uh, she actually talked about how there were often times where she couldn't get housing when she would be on the road. Oh, man. Because people would deny her housing, right? especially in the South. And if she could, she would try to like stay with a black family who would like take her in for the night. Mm -hmm. But she often ended up sleeping on her motorcycle in front of a gas station. Jeez. So she'd like take her leather jacket and roll it up and put it on the handlebars and sleep with her. And then her feet would hang on the exhaust at the end or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. Like that was how she slept. Jeez. And I just thought like that's one dangerous as hell. And two, God, that would suck. Yeah. Be so uncomfortable. Yeah. So I was like, that's really interesting that she's doing this because like she's 19. How is she able to afford? Yeah. Like traveling. Just taking off. Yeah. So it said that actually what she would do is along the way, she would stop in towns that had like carnivals or circuses happening. Mm -hmm. And she would go to the promoters and be like, hey, do you want a motorcycle trick rider? Wow. And she would she just had, pick up a job? Because when she was started motorcycling, she also taught herself tricks. Mm-hmm. Not just like how to ride a motorcycle, but like how to do crazy ass shit. Mm-hmm. So she would join these carnivals or whatever for a day or two and make a, enough money for her to be able to go on the next road trip. And she would like ride on the walls, you know, like think about like where they would have like elephants or whatever horses. Yeah. So she would ride on the walls. So like the audience would be like, in the seats and she would ride on the wall sideways. Like there were times when she would ride upside down. She was really well known for being able to ride standing with one foot on her handlebar and one foot on her seat. Jeez. I know. I was like, that's dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) Young lady, that is dangerous. I know. I wanted to be like, young lady, get down from there. (laughs) Like I can understand why her mom was like, no, (laughs) you cannot do that. You cannot do that. So when the 1940s rolled around, the country obviously became really embroiled in World War II. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the country was wanting to be helpful towards the war. So like some people bought war bonds. Uh, People were like doing everything they could to try to help the war effort. And she was not, she was one of them. She was like, how can I help? 
And so she heard about these things, these people who would be army dispatch riders. Okay. And so she was like, that. I can do that. And so she went to the army and she was like, I want to be a dispatch rider. And they were like, <laughs> how cute. <laughs> how cute. A girl. Tap, tap on top of her head. <laughs> and so she was like, fuck you. <laughs> Let me show you. And so she did. She was like, I'll do what I'll just sign me up. You'll see, sign me up and I'll show everybody. And so she had to go through this like really intense training. And it sounded to me like they really put her through the ringer because they just didn't think she was going to be able to take it, Hmm. but she did. And so she was like doing all of these crazy maneuvers. Like she already did trick riding. So that was actually came in really handy. Yeah. And at one point, the army made her create a makeshift bridge where out of like rope and tree limbs. And then she had to cross it. What? (laughs) (laughs) On a motorcycle. I thought that was insane. So it was because like, Oh yeah, you might have to cross a swamp at some point. Like she wasn't actually going in it. Like she was staying in the United States. Yeah. (laughs) But they were still like, I guess we're going to make sure you know how to put together a rope and cross it. (laughs) Okay, so she did it. <laughs> yeah, so she and she did. She learned how to do it. So they were like, I guess. And so she became the only woman dispatch rider in her unit, and it was an all African American unit. Oh wow. And she would ride between domestic army bases and carry like really important documents and things like that so that it was it would be faster than mm-hmm. if they had mail service. So she did that for a while until the war ended. But she was just always out there riding, always going on these really long road trips. And so, of course, are you? have you ever been a motorcyclist or known any cyclists? My brother is an avid motor, like, motorcyclist. He's, uh, he rides Ducatis, oh, and yeah. he's actually part of a Ducati club. He actually won um, an award in San Francisco at the National like, Ducati Conference for like, the maintenance and like, add-ons that he's done on his bike. That's really cool. He won like first place. He wasn't going to enter. He just, he rode his Ducati down there because he's like, cool, I'm going to go look at bikes. And then they were like, you want to enter? And he was like, okay. (laughs) So he enters, he wins. He wins a Tiffany glass plate and this giant bottle of champagne. And they like give him the award and they take his picture. And then he's like, I only brought a backpack because I'm on my motorcycle. I don't want to put this Tiffany plate in (laughs) But he did. He wrapped it up in his coat and put it in his backpack and he left the bottle of champagne. Does he have any horror stories about what it's like to drive on the road as a motorcyclist? Uh, he actually got in a really bad accident. Yeah. He uh, got hit by a car. On he, purpose? Um, it was not on purpose. Um, the because driver that happens turned, a lot. The driver turned left while he was going straight and hit him. And he got like, I think he got hit on one side and hit another car on the other oh side. Oh my God. He broke his foot. He broke his leg and yeah, that's terrifying. He had to have like metal pins put in. He couldn't walk. This is when my sister-in-law was pregnant with their first child. So he's crawling around on the floor trying to take care of a new baby. It was terrible, but then he got right back on. Well, my, so one of the reasons why I was drawn to this is that my, my mom and my bio dad were motorcyclists. Before I was born, they each had a motorcycle and they wow. would do trips and stuff. And my uncle was also a motorcyclist and he still is actually. And I distinctly remember in high school, there were a few times when he would go on some tr- trips, like really long trips. Like one time he, my very long, weird story that I won't get into, but my uncle's best friend ended up marrying my other aunt. Okay. Who lived in Atlanta. So he decided to go down and visit them. And he, along the way, like there were people who tried to run him off the road and shit like that. And it's that people get aggressive people, with motorcyclists. There are some people who fucking hate motorcyclists and want to actively kill them. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about that when I was researching her and I was like, how much worse would it be to be a black woman in the 40s. And so she told a couple horror stories about people trying to run her off the road. Like there was uh, one, it was like a gang of white men once who got on a on motorcycles and ran her out of town. Jeez. And one time she was driving and a guy in a pickup truck, a white man in a pickup truck pulled up next to her and like just rammed her 
off the road and flew her into the ditch and she like slammed against a tree and could have died. And like the guy just drove off. Jeez. And it was on purpose. Yeah. And, like, shit like that was happening to her pretty frequently, but she wouldn't let it keep her off her bike, which mm-hmm. I thought was really impressive. So after the war though, she's like, you know, I really want to, she'd been this whole time, like just traveling around, you know? So she got her first bike or well, her first Harley when she was, when she decided to go on this trip when she was 19. Mm -hmm. So it's been a while at this point. It's been, she's probably 29, 30 at this point. So she decides I want to find a place that's my home. So she decides to settle down in Miami, Florida. (laughs) And in the fifties, she became a nurse and she founded the iron horse motorcycle club in Miami. So she had stopped doing these really big cross-country trips for the most part, but she was still riding all the time. And in and around the Miami area, there were all of these cool motorcycle races, right? And so she was like, well, I I'll become a racer. I'll, I'll race. <laughs> and they were like, no, oh my God. you can't race. You're a girl. So she was denied every single time. They wouldn't let her race. So, you know, she did what, she, what we would all do. She'd do it anyway. She'd pretend to be a dude and enter it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so she would, here's what was great though. So, and she did this a couple of different times. And so people started to catch on eventually and they would be like, you, the blue one out. out. <laughs> oh no. But she would get there and she would keep her helmet on the whole time. She'd put her hair up inside so that they couldn't see her. And she wouldn't really talk to anybody. And she would just enter the race win the fucking race and then when then they would like be doing the whole thing in front of the crowd where they're like handing it over she'd take her helmet off and they'd be like oh she's a girl and then they wouldn't give her the prize oh no (laughs) why not she earned it you bunch of bitches yeah they would they voided every one of her winnings but i think i think she just kept doing it anyway to prove a fucking point exactly like okay yeah so she became obviously at this point pretty well known in the motorcycle community in Florida. Yeah. And started throwing these epic motorcycle parties at her house. <laughs> oh, jeez. And I was like, I want to go there. <laughs> and everyone from the motorcycling community was welcome to come, with the exception of one particular type of motorcyclist. Can you guess? What type of motorcyclist? The white supremacist. I was going to say. You Probably, know, I know. Yeah. Okay. You know I that know. there are white supremacist motorcycle gangs. Absolutely. Like, obviously. Yeah. And uh, one time a gang of white supremacists, like one of the, you know how like motorcycle, a gang is like such a negative term, but you know how like there are clubs and, yeah. and then there are actual um, motorcycle gangs. chapters. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it depends yeah. on the thing. Some of them are clubs, some of them are chapters of a organization. Mm-hmm. But you know how like, there are actual gangs yeah. that yeah. are on motorcycles. This was a gang, a white supremacist gang. And they show up to her house and they're demanding to be let into the party. Hmm. And she walked up to the biggest, whitest, stupidest motherfucker. Oh, jeez! And she just stared him down. Get off my fucking property. <laughs> and they turned around and left. Whoa. Mm-hmm. And Bessie became known as the motorcycle queen of Miami. <laughs> And at some point, this was very like weird in the timeline. I couldn't really figure out where this fit in. She became a housekeeper for a family. And this is important for one reason that I'll get to it at the end. She became a housekeeper for a family that had two little boys. And the two little boys just were like fucking in love with her, as you would be. Yeah. If this woman came rolling into your house in a leather <laughs> with a leather jacket and a motorcycle every day. As the housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> My housekeeper is the shit. And uh, this one boy, little boy in the family, Robert Scott Thomas, he recalled once this story about how his mom, it sounded like his mom maybe wasn't all there because he was like, oh yeah, she was like frequently forgetful and would just like not remember to pick us up. Hmm. And I was like, yikes. So one day they're left at school, her, him and his brother. And so Bessie shows up on her Harley clad in her leather jacket (laughs) And the two little boys jump on the bike and the one boy was so little, he like couldn't even get his arms all the way around her because he was so little. And the whole school goes absolutely bananas when they see this woman show up on this Harley and these two little boys (laughs) get on the back. And you can imagine like, put yourself in those shoes. I would feel so cool. 
And I mean, if you were like a six year old and you saw that happen, you'd be like, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> so they, like, this is one of his memories of what she was like when he was a little boy and how she told all these crazy stories and he was just so infatuated with her. He just loved her so much. And, uh, he was like, I don't think she ever told me a lie. They were crazy stories, but they were never lies. (laughs) Okay. They might have been. (laughs) It is important to note that Bessie did not have any children. She did actually, I should say she didn't have any children that lived. Okay. Okay. Her and her first husband had three babies, but they all died. Oh, jeez. And after that, she decided no children more. weren't for her. And I told you she was married six times. Mm-hmm. Her last name, Stringfield, actually came from her third husband. And she said that, and this is like, I don't know whether or not this is true. But she said, he asked me to keep his name because I'd made it famous. <laughs> <laughs> So Bessie, sometime around, I think the 80s, was diagnosed with an enlarged heart. Oh. And her doctor told her that she needed to quit riding motorcycles. And she was like, there's no way. If I don't ride, I won't live long. And so I never quit. In 1990, the American Motorcycle Association opened up its first museum in Pickerington, Ohio. And Bessie Stringfield was featured in its first exhibit about women in motorcycling. Cool. She rode Harleys until the day she died (laughs) in Opelika, Florida in 1993 at the age of 82. Jeez. Her estate was left to Robert Thomas, that little boy. Oh, whoa. Okay. As it appeared, she had no living family. Yeah. Or any heirs. And in 2000, the American Motorcycle Association created the Bessie Stringfield Memorial Award to recognize outstanding achievements by female motorcyclists. And in 2002, she was inducted into the Motorcycle Hall of Fame. And it became well known that she was the first African-American woman to ever ride across the country on a motorcycle. Oh, that's cool. In 2018, the New York Times has been doing these, you know, overlooked obituaries. Oh, yeah. So they included her in an overlooked obituary, which meant that they had to do research on her. And they Mm -hmm. couldn't just go on what other people said was her life story. They have to actually, they're the New York Times, they have to make sure that shit's verified. Yeah. So they start doing this research and they're like, I don't think that the story she told is actually her story. What? Yeah. Okay. So what they figure out is that, you know, she said that she was born to this white father and this Jamaican mother in Kingston and they came to America and blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. She was abandoned and raised by an Irish woman. Yes. None of that is true. What? Okay. None. Okay. She was not born to a white father and a Jamaican mother. She was born Bessie, which is the name that we all know her by, not okay. Betsy. She was born Bessie Beatrice White to a woman named Maggie Cherry and a man named James White, and they were both African Americans, and she was born in Edenton, North Carolina. Why would she lie about that? Because she liked having a story, a story, a legend. Mm-hmm. She wanted to be legendary. Mm-hmm. And I think she just like liked this story. And the reason why we know that this stuff she told was not true is because the Times were able to track down her actual family members. Oh, wow. The ones who were still living. And a lot of them were nieces and nephews who are now elderly. Like okay. in 2018, the nieces and nephews are in their like 70s. Okay. Uh, and maybe even older. Do they the, remember her at all? Oh, yeah. They okay. had absolute memories of her. And they talked about what it was like when she'd like ride up on her Harley and show up and to visit. And she actually, the reason why people like became really familiar with this lore about her with this Jamaican heritage and stuff is because there was a really great biography written about her called by this woman named Anne Farrar. And when the New York Times were like, um, so we're finding all of this inconsistent information. Mm-hmm. Your book says that this whole Jamaica story is correct, but we're finding out that she has these living nieces and nephews and that she was born in North Carolina and whatever. Yeah. North Carolina? Yeah, North Carolina. So the, when they call her and they're like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> like, where did you get your fact then that yeah, the story like, was true? Well, they know that they know that she got it from what Bessie said, but like as a responsible journalist, you would never just take somebody at their word. You always go and do your research. Like that's your fucking job. Yeah. And so they know that like, if she did any research whatsoever, she would have figured this out. Yeah. And so they're like, can you explain? And so she said that she wrote, she knew that it was wrong. 
But she wrote the stories that Bessie wanted because she, that Bessie had asked her to quote, tell her truth as her friend. Oh, and they had become friends. Mm -hmm. Like the woman, Anne Farrar had like started this project of writing this biography about Bessie and had been working on it for many years before she'd actually finished it and published it. And Mm -hmm. so over the course of this time that they had spent together, they had become really good friends. And Bessie was like, this is the story I want. Please, if you're my friend, don't tell it a different way. Yeah. And I always thought, like, what was wrong with the way you were born? Like, at first I thought, oh, she just wanted to be this, like, (laughs) have this crazy story. Yeah. But it became to me, like, if that was, if you were so insistent on that, then there was, must have been something wrong. Something happened. Yeah. So the New York Times tried to kind of get to the bottom of that. The nieces and nephews were still alive many of whom are elderly, they maintain that something happened in the 1950s. There was some kind of argument that the children were, quote, not privy to, and they never saw her again. Hmm. And no one ever mentioned her. She was just gone. I wonder, huh. And she, and she moved very far away. She lived in fucking Miami. Like, everybody else is, I think, in the East Coast area. I wonder if she revealed something about herself that they didn't like or or yeah. something happened. Obviously, it was a big enough break that she never, never, ever, like, when she died, no one had any idea she had family. Jeez. So that was a serious break. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why her entire estate is left to some random white dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, they were like, you're the closest thing she has to kin. Yeah. So you get all of her stuff. Huh. Yeah. And she never hinted a, of what happened. Okay. And if she did, she probably told Anne Farrar and Anne Farrar was like, I'm not telling telling you. Yeah. It's none of your fucking business. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So no matter what her beginnings were, that doesn't change what she did. Mm -hmm. Starting at age 19 and on, everything about that was the truth. She had these really incredible journeys. She broke down a ton of barriers and it's a testament to her bravery and her courage and her spirit that she was able to accomplish so much in an area that is still so white and so male Mm -hmm. it is yeah yeah i mean like we actually have a motorcycle club in spokane that's an all-black club and i've seen them a couple of times when i've gone to like a couple of events that are like about racism Mm -hmm. and they'll like one time we did this kind of semi-dangerous march uh where a black man had been killed by a white guy and we were doing a march to like point out the racism in the way that this was handled because Mm -hmm. he was basically not being charged with murder even though the man was that he killed was unarmed and they let they like surrounded us to make sure that nothing happened oh wow yeah it was and i was like it is for me i associate and i think part of this has to do with pop culture and the way that i grew up i associate motorcycles with white people yeah I just don't think, I mean, I, especially like motorcycle clubs, yeah, like, like things like, um, Ducatis or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, those are a little bit di- like Harleys. I'm like white. Oh people. yeah. Yeah. Other- especially the people around here locally. Mm-hmm. If you see a Harley Davidson sticker on the back of a truck, you know who that driver is going to be yeah. and what they're going to look like. And I'm really guilty of like being comfortable with that. With stereotypes that are not always true. Mm -hmm. Like, of course there are black motorcycle riders, like, (laughs) obviously. Like, and of course there's probably plenty of them. And I just never fucking opened my mind enough to be like, Yeah, there's a huge, like, uh, motorcycle clubs in LA, Latinos. Well, yes. And I know that from pop culture too. And they're always depicted as being, like, not good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I also think that in our pop culture we have a tendency to paint all motorcyclists as as bad people as bad people they are actually some of the nicest people and the ones who are good are fucking righteous awesome people Mm -hmm. so i did grow up with quite a few people in my life who were avid motorcyclists in fact my great uncle married this woman that my mom had known since childhood and every year they would go to sturgis on their motorcycles that's awesome even into their 70s, you know, and they were just like generous, great people. Yeah. And their kids, like their kids ride motorcycles. And it's just a, so again, I think 
again, then, then my, my association is with like native and white people that ride motorcycles. Like I just didn't even think about it. And I feel like a fucking moron, but it's like <laughs> something I just hadn't thought about. And so this is going to bring me around to how I want to end this. Okay. So starting in 2014, a group of women riders began the Bessie Stringfield all female ride. Oh, that's awesome. And it's often called the penny tour. <laughs> Because like of how she started. Yeah. So the 2016 ride to Miami ended at Bessie's last known residence in the Opalaca, Florida, where they held a small ceremony in her honor. And the mayor declared that day Bessie Stringville Day. <laughs> and the, so I went on their website, this all female ride, and I was like, I'm so curious about these women. So the group aims to educate and prepare female bikers for long distance riding through pep rallies and garage parties before they do the big ride. They also hold um, things called chat and chew and their sessions where guest speakers from the female biker community speak on topics relating to riding while female and they (laughs) riding while female. Well, you know that (laughs) they use the ride every year to donate to causes around the country, including the Hubbard house of Jacksonville, which helps victims of domestic violence and Moe's heroes, an organization that serves homeless veterans. Their next event is in Memphis, Tennessee on April 5th and 6th called the real talk garage party. Nice. And I took a look at the pictures and it's, uh, all women, obviously, mm-hmm. and mostly all black women. And there's these great photos of them, like all lined up and it's from the back and they're all looking over their shoulders. Nice. They've got their like emblems on their leather jackets and mm-hmm. stuff. And it's just like, I was like, Oh my God, I regret all my life choices. <laughs> I'm supposed to be a <laughs> black motorcyclist <laughs> in another life. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I thought their story was so neat. I thought this whole thing was neat. So I used, obviously, the New York Times overlooked obituary, blackpast.org, which has the wrong information about her origins, oh, which the New York Times actually talks about. Okay. The American Motorcycle Association Hall of Fame, Rejected Princesses, the National Motorcycle Museum. Uh, there was a great timeline bio video that w- had a couple pieces of information about the roads of America. And Wikipedia and the Bessie Stringfield all-female ride. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so, a great story. Thanks. If you live in Memphis, you should go to this event. <laughs> go to Memphis on April 4th and 5th and go Get to the Real done. Talk Garage Party. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. Right? I just want to be friends with all of these women. <laughs> I want to be friends with them. I want to hang out with them. I want to, yeah. One of my favorite things every year, I used to think I was going to become one, uh, but I don't think that'll happen. Every year at Pride, my favorite fucking thing is to watch the Dykes Dykes on on Bikes. bikes. Yeah. And now that I'm like, I heard about Bessie Stringfield, I'm like, I need more of this in my life. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So I I just really like Bessie Stringfield. I want to see a movie made about her life. Oh, that'd be so awesome. I don't know how they're going to start the beginning, though. (laughs) Do they tell the truth Um, or the lie? Um, huh. Some kind of dream sequence. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it did talk about how she like she had lots of tales that she told, and it was like people just didn't know whether or not she was telling the truth. Maybe that's what she wanted. She didn't want anybody to know her or define her. I like that. You know, I think it's we all know people who stretch the truth. Mm-hmm. I think there's probably a grain of truth to almost everything she told, except maybe her origin story. <laughs> uh, but you know. You know, she probably exaggerated because it makes for a better story. Yeah. I used to be like that when I was a kid. I would make up so many stories. Oh, I was a lying liar who lied. And one of them was uh, I made up that my father was not my real father. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go around and tell people, like, he's not my real dad. And, you know, my real dad is going to come back for me. And I love my father. Like, I was <laughs> like, it wasn't about him. It wasn't about him. It was about you. And people like look at my mom like, what? <laughs> I, uh, okay. So we talked about my school that burned down, right? And we went to school in the roller roller skating rink. Yes. The most elaborate long running lie I ever told. And it was a brilliant one. Do you remember the cabbage patch kids? Yes. Do you remember the cartoon? Kind of. It was not around for very long, but it was quite popular amongst children. And in the story, of the Couch Patch Kids, because they're literally like, this is the weirdest fucking, like, 
I, who, what drug were they on when they were, were like, babies. you know what's great? <laughs> babies um, that are vegetables. <laughs> baby heads growing inside of a cabbage. <laughs> That's fucking weird and a little bit disturbing. Oh, uh, gross. And then everybody wanted him as a doll. Yeah. Uh, weird. Okay, so th- one of the crazy creatures that were in the books and the TV shows and the commercials and whatever were these things called bunny bees. And they had the body of a B, but a bunny head and a bunny tail and like little bunny feet. Okay. Okay. So. Sounds fucked up, but whatever. (laughs) Yeah. I was in second grade and I absolutely 100% convinced a whole group of kids, I think my entire class, that one, bunny bees were real. Two, they were living in the roller skating rink where we were going to school. (laughs) And three, if they just gave me enough Luden's cough drops, I would show them to them. <laughs> Why Luden's cough drops? Those cherry motherfuckers were like crack to me. I love them. <laughs> first of all, first of all, it's a lie. Second of all, she's got a side hustle. <laughs> and man, we got like we got like most of the way into the year, and these boys were like, "She's lying." And I'd be like, no, I'm not. I'll show it to you. <laughs> and there was some, you know how like kids can become, they want to believe something so much they'll actually like think they see it. Oh yeah. And it's so, like there were kids who were like 100% believing that they saw a bunny bee that I had pointed it out. <laughs> they'd seen it in the corner. <laughs> and when that would happen, I'd be like, I am their God. <laughs> Oh my god. I was like, this is how cults happen. <laughs> <laughs> this was a weird one today, y'all. <laughs> You're glad you stuck around for the bunny bee story. I, I can't see it. <laughs> I am dying. I'm dying. I'm done. I'm well, done. I'm so glad you joined us. I did. <laughs> And uh, it was a fun episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We enjoyed both of our women. Yeah. So go use your dishwasher and look for those damn bunny bees. They're real. (laughs) And shout out to to our editor. uh, Our editor and producer is Lucas McIntyre. Music is provided by Jennifer Finch uh, of L7. And we love and heart them. And you should go buy their new album and go to their tour. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you next time, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.